Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Rosemary Thomas from Frontier Kids Care. And we help parents who are anxious about their child's well being in health, learning, and parenting. So today we have in our waiting room and with us a conversation with the amazing Dr. Liesel Winslow. Hi, Dr. Winslow. Hi, Dr. Thomas. How are you? How are you? So long I didn't see you, as we say <laughs> here in Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> it's good to see you. It's, it's good been a see. long, long time. Mm -hmm. And we know that you are basically have completed your fellowship at the prestigious Boston Children's Hospital. We see the, the um, logo in the background. And you're doing, you're ready to return, we hope, sometime later this year. Tell us, what is a developmental pediatrician? All right. So as you mentioned, I am a pediatrician, and I'm doing some specialized training at Boston Children's. Um, and so I'm essentially a doctor who works with children and families yes. um, who have challenges with development, behavior, and learning. So mm -hmm. that's what I do. Yes. And tell us about Boston Children's Hospital a little bit. <laughs> so Boston Children's Hospital, located in Boston, Massachusetts, that's in the U.S., um, it's actually the number one children's hospital in the U.S. right now, and it's affiliated with, with Harvard University. Um, so it's been a really, I'd say, intense, but um, really developmental three years of being here. And so I feel um, very well equipped to come back home and, and put, put what I've learned to use. Yes, very, very good. And so, can I try my Boston accent? Is that how it sounds? <laughs> Boston. I, I'm, I, it's been a long time, but I'm trying. <laughs> it's a particular twang to it, isn't it? Very. Yeah. It, it, it's yes. very unique. That's for yes. sure. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have, you know, in my practice and here in Trinidad and Tobago, and of course, wherever and where you are, a lot of parents who are concerned about their children's language, loss of language skills, behavior, but mainly the language skills and the lack of or lack of development of them. And the big question that at the back of their mind when they come into the room is, does my child have autism? Because of course, everyone is looking up Dr. Google, they have an idea what something about it. So that's a fair, I would say, the anxiety when they come for that initial assessment. So I want to ask you today to talk to us about autism. What is it? How is it developed? Um, who gets it? Is it boys more than girls? Just tell us something about it and then we'll talk a little bit later about how we diagnose it. Sure. Um, so I think you're absolutely right, Dr. Thomas. I think that autism has become more and more um, prevalent over time. So we're seeing actually an increase in the diagnosis of autism. Yes. And so there are a lot of parents who understandably worry about, you know, could my child have this even before their child is born? Yes. And so I think it's important to have the conversation. Um, and so hopefully by the end of, of our discussion today, you know, those who need for the evaluation will know to seek that out. And those who don't need for the evaluation can take a, take a deep breath and, and, yeah. and relax a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of what is autism, autism is what we call a developmental disability or disorder, which means that it occurs in childhood. And so this is not something that is generally diagnosed for the first time in an adult. It, mm -hmm. it, is diagnosed in young children. Um, usually these signs can, can start coming up as early as a year of age, mm -hmm. uh, but often children are not actually diagnosed until after four years of age. And, right. so, and so, you know, it's important to be, you know, vigilant um, as a parent, as a physician, as an auntie and uncle, um, to be vigilant about, you know, the red flags that we'll go on to talk about um, and just kind of thinking about 
a child's whole well-being it's not just about the cuts and the bruises but it's also you know how are they interacting with other people how are they using language to communicate you know um are there things that uh might be unusual about their behavior that you don't quite know why this is happening yes i think that you know pediatricians like dr thomas are a good source of information when these concerns come up and you know as a pediatrician we know that parents have a lot of questions and you know dr google isn't always the best place to find the answers and so if you have these concerns, if you see you're seeing something that seems unusual or different, mm -hmm. then then speaking to your pediatrician, I think, would be the first step in, in terms of figuring out what to do next. Good. And I think that's why it's important to have your health checkups, you know. So, you know, this is really critical because at each check, you know, each stage of development, we assess, we do a develop mini developmental screening where we can pick up, you know, the a little problems with language or behavior or and things like that so that's why it's so critical especially i guess nine months one year year and a half two years exactly. two and a half three that's the time at which you pick up these things generally yes, yes. yes. okay um, yes. so tell us more didn't mean to interrupt them i just no wanted problem. to you know no check ups how important they are Absolutely. And, um, you know, again, when you have a specialist like Dr. Thomas, Dr. Thomas is going to look at every area of your child's development. And if there are red flags, then she's going to refer to someone like me, a developmental pediatrician who can then do a more um, full, a fuller examination, not just a physical exam, but also see what your child's play skills are, what their communication skills are, um, you know, how do they use not just their words, but their body language to communicate with people. And, you know, a lot of what I do has, has, uh, has to do with what you, the parent, is going to tell me, but also what I see during our observational and play assessments. Um, and so in terms of of the diagnosis of autism, um, that's essentially what we do. We do an, uh, an observational play assessment where we see how a child interacts with you as a parent, but also with me as, as a stranger mm -hmm. um, to see, you know, are there behaviors that might, um, might be concerning for autism? And if not autism, what, what is it? Um, so there are a number of things that could cause um, unusual development, unusual behavior, and that's where a developmental specialist comes in is, is you know, what exactly is causing this? Um, and so, you know, as, as a parent, it's I think it's important to know that there's no blood test, there's no, mm -hmm. you know, CT scan or MRI that yeah. says, yes, there's this is autism, this is not autism. Autism is a, what we call a clinical diagnosis, meaning that a clinician like myself is going to observe your child's behavior and listen to the story that you're telling as a parent and see if your child meets the criteria for a diagnosis of autism. Mm -hmm. Okay, got you. And tell me about, you know, everybody looks up the MCHAT. What is that? Who should be administering it? And where do we go from there after we have you know, that assessment of the MCHAT? Yeah, so the MCHAT is, is an acronym for the Modified Checklist for Autism in Toddlers. Mm -hmm. And it is a checklist that you as a parent will fill out at your well child checkup. So Dr. Thomas mentioned, you know, when you come to your visits, not just for your sick visits, but for your well child checkups, that she will be screening for, she'll be looking for red flags and you know, because these visits can be brief, she wants to get more information from you as a parent. So the MCHAT does exactly that. It is a questionnaire that asks questions about your child's behavior. You, um, as a parent, fill it out. And then Dr. Thomas will look at it or your pediatrician will look at it and see whether or not there are enough um, red flags on that questionnaire that make it seem like your child could be at risk for a diagnosis of autism. And so the MCHAT is really important. It 
is usually um, administered at the 18 month visit, the 24 to 36 month visit. Um, so it, it's supposed to be given a little bit earlier, but then also later for some children who might lose skills later on. Yes. Um, and so, you know, when you go to the office and you're filling out this paperwork, you know, you really have to be thoughtful because that then triggers a series of events depending on if there are concerns about autism on this checklist. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good. Is it the most up to date? Are there better things, better screening um, modalities, or is this still tried and true? Yeah. So, um, so the M chat has been revised. So it's actually the M chat R, um, yes. but the M chat R has been out for a while now, yes, and yes. it is still considered the standard yes. here mm -hmm. um, for screening for autism. And so, um, so. There are a lot of different ways, right? You could, as a provider, a provider could just ask questions, but this is an actual, you know, a tool that we use yeah. that we have found over time is very predictive. So it, it's mm -hmm. very um, good at letting us know if we should be worried or if we should not be worried. Got you. Very good. Yes. Nice. So what I notice sometimes, for example, if a child, um, may come into the office and you give them like cars or dinosaurs or <clears throat> you know something like that to play with and you know as we say play is children's work we say that at Frontier Kids Care and we really believe it because when you put them to play you observe so many things about their you know what they do and I mean sometimes I just may go outside and come back in and the child's just lined up all the, the cars or dinosaurs or i might ask parents you know about things like that but really you just give them things to do and they just line you know and you're like okay <laughs> this yeah. definitely sounds like possible you know or quite prop you know it's possible and it's yeah. certainly a red flag tell me about your play what did you call it your play, play assessment play-based assessment play-based assessment okay. tell us about that sounds yeah. really interesting so there are this is where there's a there's there are a lot of different ways to approach this okay and so as i mentioned there's no like specific test that's going to say yes or no this mm -hmm. is autism um but there have been some practices that have been developed um for us clinicians to be able to elicit or try to gain from that child a, a social response is what i will i will call mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. And so, um, for example, you know, Dr. Thomas talks about, talks about just, you know, leaving some toys out and having a child play with them and seeing what they do on their own. That's mm -hmm. really important um, because sometimes what we see is that a child is not playing with a toy in the way that it was designed. Mm -hmm. And so they may play with parts of the toy or they may get stuck on a, you know, a a, a door or a doll's eye instead of rolling mm -hmm. the car back and forth, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so free play is definitely very, very much a part of the play-based assessment and it allows the child to express themselves and we can see what, what their self-expression looks like in play. Um, but what the, the assessment also is going to look at is not just what they're doing on their own, but how they interact with people. How mm -hmm. do they make requests? Yes. And so um, there are a lot of children with autism who um, they may have a few words, but they don't necessarily uh, they don't necessarily use them functionally. And when I say functionally, they're not using them to communicate, you know, to socialize. Mm -hmm. They might just be labeling things and not trying to string words together. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that play-based assessment, one of the things that we generally are going to do is that we're going to try to encourage this child to communicate. And so we might have a toy that's really interesting to them and we might play with it a little bit and then we withhold it mm -hmm. to see, you know, does this child look at me? Does this child yeah. make a request for this toy? Or, you know, do we immediately have a meltdown? Do we immediately have, you know, this child just moving on to something else, even though they really want the toy, they're not trying to make requests. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the other thing we look at. The third thing that we often look at, and this 
play-based assessment will vary with age because we expect different ages of children have to have different skills. Um, is this your child's pretend play? So when they're playing with, with items, you know, we set up a little scenario. Um, sometimes we let them lead the scenario. Sometimes we kind of give them some help mm -hmm. and then we just kind of see, you know, does this child let me um, join their play and are they, are they pretending, you know, to play with the items in the way that we would expect. Um, and so those are the, the kind of some of small parts of this assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and overall, we're looking at, you know, how many words are you using? Are you using them to communicate? How are you relating to your family? Is there any repetitive behavior that we are not sure what the function is? Because all of those things kind of go into helping us to know if this is, is autism or not. Mm -hmm. That's good. Now, I want to ask you something. Sometimes when parents come there and you administer the question, you ask them things, there is often a great bit of denial. And also you may find that one parent um, may see things in one way and the other, you know, another way. Sometimes I actually may give each parent <laughs> the assessment to do and then bring it together. Or, you know, it's sometimes difficult because you may find you ask one parent the questionnaire and they tick off everything, <laughs> you know, correct, you know, positive, no red flags, no critical areas. And then another parent may see something. Or oftentimes in our extended family situation, it might be the grandparent or an aunt or somebody who who comes along, who is the one who is concerned. Do you see that in your setting and how would you address that? Absolutely, absolutely. We see it all the time where, <laughs> yes. you know, children either, um, either they are better acquainted with and have a better relationship with one family member as opposed to another and so they might socialize differently with one family mm -hmm. member as opposed to another um we sometimes see it as you mentioned where um there's another like maybe an extended family member who is kind of looking in from the outside mm -hmm. and yeah. and seeing things that yeah. um that the parent who's like in the situation who you know, knows their child so well, can interpret their needs and provide them before they even have yes. to ask for them. Yes. And to not realize that it's unusual for a child to not make a request or not um, not initiate interactions. And so, so we do get that a lot where there's a difference in opinion about whether there's a problem or not. And um, and there, there are, I would say there are a lot of different ways to, to bridge that gap. Um, I think at the very core of the issue, everyone wants to do what's best for this child. Yes. And so I think that having an open conversation with the parents, you know, the caregivers, the family members about what is best, you know, mm -hmm. we know that early intervention for autism is the better thing. So getting a diagnosis sooner rather than later can change the trajectory or mm -hmm. can change the course on which this child um, is about to embark. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what do you have to lose by doing a, a deeper evaluation? Mm -hmm. You know, even if, let's say, Dr. Thomas, you referred to me, a child to me, a family to me, and mom is like, this child is, has no issues. I, I like this child and I get along perfectly. And grandma is saying, I, I see a little bit of um, unusual behavior here. Mm -hmm. Having a developmental pediatrician do an evaluation to either rule in or out autism is going to be helpful, either to get this child the resources and um, supports that they need for a diagnosis of autism, or figure out if there's something else that needs to be addressed, even if it's not autism. Like, how can we? advance this child's development, even if it's not a diagnosis of autism. So it's kind of, you know, weighing, weighing the pros and cons of, should we do a deeper dive? I think, you know, the challenge sometimes is like, if it's a physical issue that a child presents with, of course, this parent is going to bring them to the hospital, to the doctor, you know, they want the, the band-aid, they want the antibiotics or, or 
you know, whatever the, the treatment might be. Mm-hmm. But sometimes with developmental challenges, you know, families feel like this child might grow out of it, you know, that this, you know, I had a, a uncle who was just like that. Yes. And, you know, yes. so there's there's that kind of this is normal for us. And it might be, but you know, thinking about what do we have to lose if we miss this diagnosis and what we have to gain mm-hmm. if we make it early is is how I generally approach the conversation with families. Excellent. I like that. And you know, um, we have it's called an autism, autism spectrum disorder. It's a spectrum. So I find it particularly um, challenging or sometimes difficult, not just to diagnose, but to help parents of children who are on the milder end of the spectrum, what we would have called Asperger's. I know there isn't, they don't call it that as such technically anymore, but it still is perhaps easier to use that word, especially in our setting in parents who, you know, the child is functional fairly much, but there are issues. Tell us something about that and what your perspective on this is. Yeah, um, I think you bring up a, a few good points, Dr. Thomas, in terms of, you know, we often say if you've met a person with autism, you have met a person with autism. Mm-hmm. That does not mean that everybody with autism is going to look that way. Yeah. They are very much individuals in their own right, just mm-hmm. like everyone else. Absolutely. And so that's where the spectrum comes up. You have some people who are going to be more impacted by their impairments or their challenges are going to be more impacting on their daily life. And then there are some people who are less impacted. And those mm-hmm. are often the children who are harder to diagnose at, mm-hmm. at the beginning. So they might be diagnosed a little bit older even you know, when the social demands become more and more, you know, challenging, that's sometimes when we start seeing it in, in the children who are, are not as significantly impacted by the, the um, diagnosis of autism. Um, and so in terms of the range of severity, um, you, I think you captured it fully in terms of there are some people who are have such mild symptoms mm-hmm. that they may not need as much support. And I think that, you know, it would be more convenient maybe to have a separate name for, for people who are less affected. Um, but at the same time, what we don't want is for those children to not get any support because people feel like their autism is so mild, you yeah. know? Yes. And so I think that that is, there, there are definitely pros and cons to, to having a child labeled or, um, you know, uh, considered as having autism versus having a separate diagnosis of As- Asperger's. Um, because, you know, I think if you ask a, an autistic person or a person who has autism this question, you will get a variety of different answers in terms of whether what they prefer. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so what I think is that more than the label, we should focus on their functioning. Mm-hmm. So how do we help this child access school, access extracurriculars, access relationships and social interactions? Um, like the focus really should be on, you know, regardless of what we call this, how do we help this child maximize their potential and be their best selves? Exactly. Um, exactly. I mean, there are even people who have been diagnosed as adults many times, you know, and um, I know that book by John Elder Robinson, I think it's called Look Me in the Eye. It's a really, really nice. <laughs> yes, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll send you the, it's a really nice, it's a, it's a book about this guy who, He's on the spectrum, probably on the milder end, and he always knew he was different, but it wasn't until he he used to be obsessed with fixing cars and so on. And it wasn't until one of his clients, he used to fix, you know, some high-end cars. I forget what type it was in your area, same Boston area, I believe. And it wasn't until he had a client who was a psychologist (laughs) who said to him, you know, this is what you have. And it just like, wow, it hit him like a ton of bricks because all the things that had 
you know, affected him throughout his life. So sometimes you diagnose it very late and, um, but of course it's better to do it early so that you can prevent all these psychosocial issues that would happen if it's not dealt with. And if the child and our parents especially don't own the diagnosis, you know, you find that, you know, the de denial does not really go too well in the end. Many times I would say maybe tell someone, I think you're, this is what I think it is or with screening it's possible. Because I always bring some degree of saying what I think is going on, not diagnosing, but certainly what I think. Because oftentimes you never see that child until maybe four or five years down the line because the parents just will not accept. So I think it's important whenever you see a child with you know, possible developmental behavioral issues to mention to the parents and at least insert it into their consciousness so they could think about it. And, you know, some will accept it and go on to be further evaluated, most, and some um, don't, but they do come back when things become more apparent. Absolutely. You know, so I want to ask you then briefly, what would be your next steps after we have done this? Yeah, so, you know, I think to your point, Dr. Thomas, you know, being diagnosed with autism is a life-changing mm -hmm. thing for, mm -hmm. for children and families. Yes. And I think that in some cases, that denial of the diagnosis or the denial of, of a child's challenges um, often stems from a place of, of grief you know, yes, and, yes, yes. And this is, you know, a child that I expected to be able to do certain things with me. You know, this is a, you know, I look at the other children that my siblings have or my, my friends have and my child is different. Yeah. And it's, it's something that can be difficult to accept. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, you, your commitment to partnering with parents and kind of walking along this road with them until they get to the point of being able to accept the, the diagnosis is very pivotal and it's helpful, not, not from a place of judgment, but from a place of, you know, maybe you're not able to accept it today, that's okay. Mm -hmm. What can we do to help him in the meantime? Whether or not you, you accept the diagnosis. Point, yes. But what, what can we do to help yes. Johnny or Timothy? Um, and so, mm -hmm. In terms of management, like how how do we treat it? You know, it's it's also not a quick fix in terms of here's an antibiotic, here's a shot, here's a yes. painkiller. Yes. There's no quick fix for mm -hmm. a diagnosis of autism. Um, the standard of care is something called behavioral therapy, yes. and that can take many forms. I think the most commonly um, widely known form of behavioral therapy is called applied behavior analysis therapy or ABA therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's used widely here in the US. I think at home, it's a little bit more difficult to access. Um, mm -hmm. But the goal really is to help this child learn some of these skills that we would have expected them to learn kind of naturally from looking at the environment around them. For children who have autism, you know, sometimes they can be fixated on their interests and they may not be observing things that are happening in their environment and yes. learning from what's happening in their environment. And so what behavioral therapy is supposed to do is to help these children learn those skills, learn some of the cultural body language, eye contact, you know, back and forth conversation um, and that kind of thing. But also this behavioral therapy is supposed to help minimize some of the challenging behavior that we can see with autism, whether it's prolonged tantrums um, or sometimes, you know, a child might fixate on something and it might be okay. They're not bothering anybody. They're not bothered. That's fine. <laughs> but if it starts, you know, impacting their ability to go out into the community, their ability to engage in school and learning, then those are behaviors and that we want to make sure that, that we are working on so that this child can really, um, really interact with the environment around them in a way that's meaningful. Yeah. Um, so that's the main, I mean, behavioral therapy is the main thing, 
The other things that we often um, recommend are speech therapy. And so, as you mentioned, Dr. Thomas, a, a language delay is often one of the first red flags that something might be going on. And so children with autism, they have challenges with not just verbal communication or using words to communicate, but also nonverbal communication. So facial expressions, being able to, to pick up on those social cues, but also give off those social cues. Mm -hmm. And so um, a speech therapist can be helpful in working on language, verbal language, and if not verbal, then maybe using pictures or you know, a device to communicate, um, but also the nonverbal communication. So how do you socialize? And so speech therapy is really important. Even if a child is considered to have mild autism, mm -hmm. I think that a speech therapist can be really helpful in um, helping this child to, to learn to communicate in a way that that is going to, to make them more successful. Mm -hmm. um, other things, occupational therapy can sometimes be helpful if a child is having a lot of sensory aversion, so mm -hmm. they can tolerate certain textures of food or clothing or sounds. Mm -hmm. um, occupational therapy can be helpful with those things um, in terms of making sensitizing or like uh, getting children more um, well, less sensitized to some of these, these everyday sounds and, and interactions that they might have. Mm -hmm. um, and then last but not least is medication. So as I mentioned, there's no medication that is going to um, change the diagnosis of autism. It's not. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes the behavior can become unsafe for the child or for the child's family. Mm -hmm. You know, we have children who sometimes are bolting or running, you know, running away, running into the street. They might become aggressive sometimes. Um, and so when we have a child with some more extreme behavior that might be harmful to themselves or to other people, mm -hmm. that's when we start thinking about, okay, is this, does, does this need to be treated with, with a medication? And the medication of choice would have to do with what's the behavior we're seeing, as well as understanding that autism um, or persons with autism often also develop other mental health challenges. So like depression or bipolar or all, all these other things that may require treatment. And so kind of thinking about what's happening and, you know, do we need to intervene with medication? Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. I love this is great. This is amazing. Now I want to ask you, Dr. Lisa, can I call you Dr. Lisa? Yeah. <laughs> I sure. love your first name. It reminds sure. me of Lisa in the Sound of Music, <laughs> my absolute favorite movie exactly. ever. Exactly. <laughs> so, Dr. Lisa, what do you what do you think you can offer coming back to Trinidad and Tobago, considering that we may not have all the same modalities of treatment and so on that you have access to up in the in the U.S., especially in a very specialized um, children's hospital such as where you've been training. Yeah, that's, a, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot, Dr. Thomas, um, <laughs> because I did spend some time practicing medicine in Trinidad before, you know, moving to Boston for training. And it's something that that has been on my mind. How do I take what I'm learning here and yeah. adapt it to our community at home, yes. which is very unique in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, our patient population, but also these services that are available. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so there are already community partners that exist, right? There are, there are a number of people who are advocates for children with developmental disabilities and who have been working extremely hard um, to level the playing field and, and um, make sure that, that our children have access um, to, to their environment. And um, I think as far as me coming home, I think, that brings a new perspective, having been trained elsewhere, a fresh mm -hmm. eye mm -hmm. to see, yes. you know, I'm not going to try and make a mini Boston in Trinidad, no. but are there are things that we can adapt at home. Is there, mm -hmm. are there things that we could do better, even yes. if it's not exactly the same? Right. And so, um, so that's one of the things I'm thinking about, like, what are these structures that currently exist and how can we adapt them and how can we you know take the things that are good from the u.s leave the things that we don't want mm -hmm. um, and adapt yeah. them to our patient population yes. um, but another thing that i have 
learned from being here is just the power of collaboration and the power of a team and partnership. Mm -hmm. And that's not just with our speech therapists, our occupational therapists, our developmental specialists, but also with families and schools mm -hmm. and like, you know, the community. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is the thing that I feel most strongly about is partnering with my families and providing them with, with the support mm -hmm. of, you know, even though we may not know what the next step is, we're going to figure it out together. I, I think that that's what I, I bring I bring with me when I come back home. Well, I love this, I love this. And we are so excited that you are coming back home. <laughs> Please don't change your mind. <laughs> and I'd like to know how we can find you. Would you have a waiting list, a VIP waiting list or something like that? Because you know, the parents are important people. They're very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very important. The most they are very important people. <laughs> and we want to create, I mean, I think, would you have a list that people can pre-register? Because of course, um, your services will be in great demand because of the, you know, the lack of, you know, the, you know, our system is not as coherent, cohesive as you have. And there are lots of children languishing, needing assessments. So tell us. Yeah, so um, you can reach me directly at my email address, my professional email address, which is my name, Dr. Dr. Liesl Windsor at gmail.com. And I know Dr. Thomas is gonna share that in her, in her, um, in her uh, notes for this, this yes. talk. Um, as to your question about a wait list, yes, I intend to to have a wait list up and running. Mm -hmm. um, I'm we're currently we're working on the website. Yes. And so as soon as that information becomes available, um, I'll I'll definitely share that with Dr. Thomas, yes. um, and then you can disseminate it. Um, but for any questions, any concerns, um, you can definitely reach out to me directly at my email address, as I mentioned. Um, I'm again, finishing up here in Boston and will hopefully be returning home in August. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, <laughs> that's, that's the timeline that we're looking at, but um, definitely open to, to starting those conversations now and, um, and getting children lined up for evaluations, but also for follow-up and like tracking of their progress and that kind of thing. Excellent. Well, Dr. Lisa Winslow, it has been wonderful chatting with you. I think you opened up, you know, you really opened up this box of questions and really answered. We took out so many bits of wisdom from it. Really, really great bits of wisdom. So thank you very, very much. And we really look forward to seeing you back home soon. Thanks so for having me. I appreciate yes. it. And take care and bye for now. <laughs> bye, Dr. <after> Summer. <laughs>